Hello, it's Jen Taub. Welcome back to Booked Up, a podcast that features you, me, and our favorite authors. Today, I'm speaking with Pulitzer Prize winning writer, Connie Schultz. She's the author of two memoirs. The first one is Life Happens and Other Unavoidable Truths. And the second, And His Lovely Wife, a memoir from the woman beside the man. Connie made her fiction debut in 2020 with her New York Times bestselling novel, The Daughters of Erie Town. And this coming February, the youngest readers can welcome into the world her first children's book, Lola and the Troll. And I have it on good authority that this book came into being after Connie and so many others that she knows were trolled on Twitter. Connie was a columnist at The Plain Dealer in Cleveland and wrote a weekly column for USA Today. She just launched a substack called Hopefully Yours. When she's not writing, she's teaching. She was at Kent State for seven years, her alma mater. And this fall, she's joining the faculty of Denison University's journalism program. Connie lives in Cleveland with her husband. You might know him, Senator Sherrod Brown. And you might also know her very sweet or their very sweet rescue dogs, Franklin and Walter. Connie and Sherrod have four children and eight grandchildren. What makes Connie so special is that she is one of those women who lifts as she rises or carries as she climbs, a true friend who is there for you in moments of doubt and moments of joy. Okay, let's dive in. Hey, Connie. Hi, Jen. How are you doing? Well, great. (laughs) (laughs) Can we just pretend we didn't have the tech issues? Let's just not let anyone know. Okay. Oh, I get so anxious about those. And I always assume they're my fault. So I'm (laughs) really happy to be here. (laughs) So before we had like the tech situation that no one should ever be told about, you were holding up a cute little pillow of a dog. What was that? I I was explaining why I was breathless when I signed on because the doorbell had just rung and this delivery just arrived. And it's, I have two of them. And to explain to listeners, <laughs> I really <laughs> become that grandmother I always mocked. Um, they are pillows in the shape of the head of their pet, Mouse, uh, who's a dog with really big ears because they had seen dog pillows of Franklin and Walter that I had made for grandpa that he keeps in his capital office in Washington. And they fell in love oh. with them. So I'm just that ridiculous now. That's what I can do. Can you just hold it up again so I can act adequately or accurately describe? So that pillow... The face is the size of Connie's face, but the ears are each, I mean, gigantic. We don't have a mouth. We just have a boopy, adorable nose. What is the name of this pup? Is it a Chihuahua or what kind of dog is this? um, I think it's a Chihuahua mix. And his name is Mouse because that's what my little Mouse. Mouse. And um, she got, my daughter got them, found this dog as a rescue pretty quickly after their Longtime rescue dog Tony had died. So Milo Aww. has pictures of Tony taped to his headboard, but he sleeps with Mouse every night. And the kids fell in love with the pillows. So here I am. I'm the grandma. Is that the- Mouse spelled M O U S E or M A U S? M O U S E. Okay. Because it might be a little dark for a child to name it. Well, yes. <laughs> You're no, laughing, but no, I no, I mean, I'm laughing. You're right. I'm laughing because I, I asked my daughter Amelia, and she said, "Really, mom? Really? He's seven. <laughs> <laughs> so you're I'm- laughing because we're separated at birth. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh my god, that is so funny. Um, well, that is adorable. When are you going to present this this gift? I'm just going to wrap it in tissue, write in one of the grandma notes that I tend to do with my own little illustrations that no one shall ever see except my grandchildren and their parents and ship it off. So speaking of illustrations, uh, your forthcoming book in February, I can't believe we have to wait so long, um, is a children's book called Lola and the Troll. But you don't do the illustrations for that, right? Oh, no. The illustrator is Sandy Rodriguez, and she has brought this entire story to life. I I will be writing more about her at some point soon on my um, Substack that I'm starting, hopefully yours, because we... What the thing about children's books, and I'm sure you understand what I mean. I mean, I love children's books. I imagine, Me too. right? And I love when the, the when the really terrific story melds with the illustrations that just seem made for that story. I'm hoping that's how people will see this. I certainly have no doubt they're going to love the illustrations. And um, I had never written a children's book, so this whole process. I'm with Razor um, Razor Bill Books with Random House, right? So. Uh-huh. 
Random House. And they immediately started asking, once they loved the book, the, the text, well, how do you imagine Lola looks? How does her little dog tank look? And I thought, wow, I didn't, I didn't know I get to do that. So um, I st- sent them some pictures of um, our five-year-old granddaughter, Ella, who is um, a beautiful little Latina. Her father's from El Salvador. And I just thought, this is, this is what I want to do. I want to be as inclusive from the beginning. I want, and by inclusive, of course, I'm meaning also let's, let's have a grandchild in there. And Tank is modeled after our dog, Walter. So I got to have these ideas, but for the troll, for example, I wanted to leave that up entirely to Sandy. I'm so glad I did. And she came up with so many other moments I wouldn't have even anticipated because she has a sense of humor. Um, I was hoping I was bringing a sense of humor to the book. She really magnified it and, and made it so much bigger in the way that I hope allows parents to enjoy it, you know, appreciate it and laugh at it, uh, while the kids also get the message that's intended at a different level, right? That's always the challenge with these kinds of books. Did you find yourself changing any of the text after she illustrated, or did you keep it all the same? Pretty much the same, but I found myself sending her a lot of thank yous. For example, um, Lola, the way the troll keeps uh, bullying Lola is holding up these signs with horrible messages about her. Oh, I don't even know what the story is about. Is it okay for you to say? Or you need oh, to yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, oh, what's no, the story? No, it's not. The story is about a little girl. Gee, I wonder where I got the idea of trolls, right? This actually I came... have no idea, Connie, not at all. <laughs> In fact, this idea, this whole book came about because of Twitter. Believe <laughs> it or not. It did, because I... I believe posted, you. One day I posted on Twitter, um, because I, I also have an active Facebook page, and I'm always blocking trolls there. And at one point, I had to announce to a whole cast of women who had just been trolled by some guy named Tom. And I said, Tom, the troll has been blocked. And somebody jokingly said, that'd be a great children's book. So I you know, tiptoe over to Twitter and say, hey, I think I'm going to write a children's book and call it Tom, Tom, the troll has been blocked. Just joking. And within yeah. an hour, my agent, Gail Ross, calls me and said, why are you writing a children's book? When did you start doing that? And I said, <laughs> I'm not writing a children's book. It's where well, you are now. And the editor of Razor, I mean, they had already reached out to my agent. So that's how the whole thing came about. So, of course, trolls are, have been on my mind throughout my, certainly my online career, right? And as a columnist, right. let me tell you that, Jen. You and I have had, we, we've had <laughs> conversations over the years. Um, um, a couple between ourselves, many with our other friends, most of whom are women, right? Yeah. Uh, so I had, I had this notion that, well, how do I show bullying by a troll in a children's book? And I came up with these signs that he holds up at her as she's walking to school each day. And so if he tells her oh. her hair is too big, she starts wearing it in a tiny bun. And he says her eyes are, there's something wrong with her eyes. So she starts wearing big sunglasses so nobody can see her eyes. Well, Sandy came up with even more. This is my childhood. Wait. Oh, wow. Okay. Maybe I mean, I but go ahead. They yeah, weren't but, trolls. It was just, I remember the kid. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> See, that's the thing, though. Even in its draft form, when I'm telling women about this book, I'm hearing from women who are telling me these stories, hmm. um, who, who remember being bullied at a young age. You don't have to be on Twitter to have experienced bullying right. as right. a girl in America, right? Sorry to cut you off. Continue. Though. No, so no. he's holding these signs. And so she yes. adjusts herself. She internalizes Absolutely. the criticism. Yes, to yeah. the point where she's unrecognizable even to herself. She looks into the mirror at some point and it basically says, am I still me? What I love that Sandy did is as she's discarding these parts of herself, like Sandy came up with a tutu, right? Mm -hmm. And he says that she's got this book of donations and Lola is literally putting things that used to belong to her into the giveaway box. And I never Uh. thought of that. That was just, I thought, genius on her part. And then a mother recently responded to the picture of it because I was allowed to share a couple pictures from the book and said, I have that box. I wonder how many others of us have that box. I'd like to get some of the things I discarded in myself. I'd like to get those back. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's a whole other part of the story I hadn't even anticipated. This is what's so exhilarating about writing a book like this. Honey, this metaphor is just awakening me this self-help thing, which is, you know, this is, you know, could really happen or we can just talk about it. But I want to ask you, you know, either you, well, you actually, and I haven't thought myself, but if we both had a cardboard box, like right here, what are the things that we would be pulling out that we discarded? I mean, that's a really personal question. I'm just speaking, you know, but wow, that's, that's a lot. 
Right. I mean, for me, I can speak pretty directly to, I mean, when I started working in a newsroom and some people thought it was really important, they let me know that I laugh too loudly or that I'm too cheerful for a newsroom. I, I've often joked that before I met my husband, Jared Brown. It's just I, helping you to let you know. Pardon me? Just helping you to let you know that you're too cheerful. Just giving you that advice. <laughs> it's be helpful for you. Yeah. You're totally yeah. too happy for this yeah, place. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was in my 30s, keep in mind. I had been a freelance writer for years. I often joke that um, before I met my husband, Sherrod Brown, you know, he's a senator, right? U.S. senator. I think I've heard of him. It sounds familiar. Okay. You, may, you may know who he is. I thought I was an extrovert. But after I met Sherrod, I realized I was an extrovert in a newsroom, which simply meant that I was cheerful, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, So <laughs> that was something I was often... I, I, so I think about how, even if you tell yourself you're not going to let people change it, you start to become very self-conscious. Yep. And that's well, that's the first step, right, to getting you to start. So what would you discard? What have you discarded that you ought to be pulling back out of that box? Wow, you know, it's really weird that the first, I thought of two different things. I'll say the second thing. The second thing I thought of is my trust of people. That Ooh. seems pretty deep. But I, I think Ooh. maybe... Wow. I mean, there's, I think maybe the theater stuff that I love when I was young, you know, I really, I really love theater, like sitting in the audience um, and just being taken away by the magic of it all. I've, I've let myself, let myself, I've let myself go back. Um, but I remember the first time I ever saw a live, a, a, like a real theater performance. I grew up in Michigan, sorry, not Ohio, you know, rivals and all that. And uh, well, I'm bit, well, I'm not an Ohio State person, remember. I went to Kent State, so I don't. I, I know, but when you talk about like, okay, so you wrote about, in, it, you know, in the, the Daughters of Erie Town, Shaker Heights is is the Tony suburb where the boyfriend lived. I grew up in West Bloomfield, sort of Bloomfield oh. Hills area, except we were, this sounds so weird. Like my father was a doctor. So you would think, okay, you know, Bloomfield Hills doctor, but we were like in, you know, West Bloomfield, not as fancy, you know, everywhere you go, there's always a class hierarchy anyway. Yes, that's right. um, but I remember as a kid, we went down to Detroit to the Fisher Theater, which was the only place that had traveling Broadway shows. And the musical we saw, it was in the 70s. It was Pippin. And I remember the smell of the grease paint. And I remember the magic I, I felt when that chorus came to sing. It just awaken something in me that I, I I just always felt and I anything everything I wanted to do was about getting to New York um but I I came to understand later in life that there's a difference between wanting to be in the audience and wanting to be on stage or being capable of being on stage does that make any sense to you did you have yearnings to be on stage um you know I did try well so I was in some singing groups as a, a, a teen but I remember the big heartbreak I kept a journal the big heartbreak and I don't know why I'm doing this Connie I'm supposed to be interviewing you but no, anyhow I, I would love to know and I'm sure your listeners would like to know uh, so you know I was in the singing group it was called the woodwinds but the fancy singing group you could audition for when you like entered your sophomore year or junior year etc was called the madrigals you know it was a madrigal type group and I remember when I I was rejected from that. And I was devastated, utterly devastated in the drama. I went back the other day and looked at the journal entry of this. And it was like the melodrama, like my dreams are crushed. Oh, wait, Connie, wait, this is so funny. Okay, so my dreams are crushed. This is what I was going to do. Uh, and I later, my friend who is actually writes operas, uh, Luna Pearl Wolf, she's an incredible uh, composer in Canada. I told her this story and she said, well, why were you rejected? And I said, the teacher said my voice didn't blend. <laughs> and, and and she goes, well, then you oh, could have been a, she goes, you could have been a soloist. Soloist, I'm like, exactly. Oh, for F's sake. And what's so funny. So anyway, I went back and I was reading this literally last August because one of my kids, I have a teen, I have a teen and I have a 23 year old. So I was, you know, you go back and you pull these things off the shelf. And I said, look, and I wrote this. And then the next sentence is, well, you know, now that I can't be a performer, you know, maybe I'll, you know, I have to have a fallback career. So maybe lawyer or president of the United States. <laughs> what would you say? I know. It cracked I love me that. up. No, but what I love about that is you were still imagining yourself in big ways, right? I well, love that. And then what was really funny is later that day, a friend of mine who, um, uh, I can say this because it's not private, uh, uh, Nira Tandon, 
the know, Center for sure. America. Probably, now she's at the White House. We'd been in touch and she invited, literally that day, I checked my Twitter DMs and she said, hey, Jen, it's been a long time. I'd love to invite you to the White House. So then I'm just getting all the chills and all that stuff. So I laughed at myself. I, you know, I'm not going to be president of the United States, Connie. That's not in my, in the cars, but the, but like the oh, I'm idea. Happy for you. I'm happy for you that you're not going to be president. Yeah. Of well, me too. I'd like you to have a normal life. I'm really, I'm really glad now. I mean, there's something, um, you and I had this one conversation when I realized at one point in my life, you know, maybe five years ago that, you know, kind of like you said, you were too loud for a newsroom that I, you know, that speaking up, I'm a little bit too loud for a traditional political role. You know, I can be a citizen, I can speak out from the outside, I can be an academic or a podcaster, but I'm not going to be able to be in those roles. And I felt in some ways crushed. Maybe it's because the ambitious side of me, maybe it's that little girl writing in the diary. Um, but I remember we had this conversation and you said, I, I trust that you know who you are. And it was the nicest, kindest thing you said to me, because again, if you know who you are, then you're happy doing what you do and you're not trying to fit yourself or erase yourself. Because, you know, if I have to erase myself or silence myself to do something, then I'm not myself because I am just a bunch of words that need to be spoken. That's what I Boy, am. Do I, this really resonates with me right now because I'm about to embark on a very different kind of format really for my writing. I mean, I've done all these different things and I understand that, but as a columnist, I've always felt ethically bound to make sure that the lines are in place between what my husband does for a living, right? And what I'm right. trying to do, it grows increasingly difficult because, you know, you don't marry a middle a middle age unless you have a lot in common, or at least you shouldn't. And right. we do, right? And I write a lot about politics and I've been getting, um, I find I am increasingly weary of these lines that exist only because I have to make sure that who I'm working for never feels compromised, that they don't feel like I'm getting too close to the line when this is certainly part of who I am, but I always have to be refracted through the lens, particularly as Sherrod is now running for re-election, refracted through that lens of Senator's wife. Uh -huh. And so for me, leaving USA Today, which you know I, I have one big project I'm finishing up for them that matters a great deal to me, um, but my editor left, Kristen Del Guzzi, and it seemed like a good time for me to be rethinking it. And I thought, well, I discovered pretty quickly after I left, I still want to write. I want to weigh in on things, but I want to weigh in on everything. And I want to write personal essays when I feel like it. I want to weigh in on politics. I want to weigh in with back, you know, some scenes from a campaign, what it feels like to, not in any kind of promotional way, although, I, of course, I could be accused always of humanizing my husband, which cracks me up. Who do they think I married, right? I didn't. Not, he's hardly a robot. Right. But I feel like I'm merging for the first time. I'm merging all my worlds, all, all these different parts of my life into one place. And mm -hmm. it gets to what you were saying, because I know who I am. Yeah. And we can fall prey to the definitions that others have of us and the boundaries they want to put around us. And while I respect certainly the ethical boundaries of journalism, I'm not too crazy anymore about the need for me to keep packaging in that tighter frame. Um, so, and my agent basically was just blunt. She said, you can't just disappear. Um, you know, you're working on books, but you, she encourages me because she likes how I write, which I appreciate. She's my agent and I would hope she'd feel that way. But she also really forced me to think about, well, well what do you want to do in the world then? Right. What do you want your writing to look like when you're not working on a book? And um, at first I was going to use the subtitle of my first book, unavoidable truths. And she rightly reminded me that so many people are laying claim to the truth these days, what they think. Uh -huh. is true. And yeah. she said, this is this whole personal part of you, which is how I came up with hopefully yours. Mm -hmm. um, because if I could name one thing that has been a consistent fact of my life is that I am always in search of reasons for hope. And I find and hopefully it. yours is the name of the sub stack that you're launching right now. Yeah, it's probably going to start next week. I just uh, finalized the illustration for the logo um, by the very talented Chris Morris, who did a, a illustration of me for Room Raider when the book came out. And I reached out to him because he's a Cleveland artist. And I thought yeah. he, he's a Cleveland artist and I really love his work. And I just signed off on the on it today. I'm very excited about it. But it's, I'm nervous. I'm really nervous. But I keep reminding myself what I always tell my kids and what I tell my students all the time. If you're never scared, you've stopped growing. So, well, you also said 
I mean, I know it's the, you know, through the narrative voice and the daughters of Erie Town, one of the characters or through through the omniscient narrator or point of view narrator said, fear has a way of blinding a person to his own potential or her own potential or their own potential. Yeah, I do think that. In fact, I think the title of my first piece, I'm still working on, but I think it's going to be Womanly Ambition because ah, we spend I so much it. of our time even trying to talk ourselves out of ambition, at least earlier in our careers, I did. I'm a bit older than, I'm quite a bit older than you, I think. I'm, mm. I'm going to be 66 next week. And, well, uh, I'm 56, so you could be my big sister. Okay, well, I would love that role. But <laughs> I'm telling you, it's made me look back more on how, especially when I'm trying to, um, you know, we talk a lot about caring as you climb. And I think that's so important to do, particularly mm -hmm. for women of my generation, because not enough, enough of us are doing it. I don't think it's because a lot of women don't want to. I think they don't see the value in themselves. They don't see how much they they have to offer younger generations. But and for me, that is crucial. But what it requires is for me to also be more re reflective about how I got where I am right now in my career and how often I was explaining myself all the time for an ambition that men never feel the need to explain at all. Um, including to some, you know, some women, women friends. It wasn't always to men, but it was women. Oh, yeah. And too often to myself. Too yes. often to myself. You know, it's, it, I mean, one thing about being empathic or being an observer is that it's easy to um, imagine someone else's point of view. So it's, I think it's healthy to have the kind of self-awareness where you can imagine, understand, or feel the impact you are having on the people around you. But the question is, what do you do with that? And I think that, you know, I think about the characters in The Daughters of Erie Town and how each generation kind of maybe ends one of the cycles from the generation before finds a way to be themselves, but yet still the most recent, the character closest to your age, Sam, um, you know, closest to the way maybe you and I are both raised where even though we may feel, you know, guilty about it or whatever, we know that it's good and fine to have our own ambition to do stuff we want to do. However, the limit on that is, um, you know, let me just say it differently. I just feel like before me, the idea was the only ambition you're supposed to have is to support your husband or your kids, or if you have a job, your boss, but, or the world, you know, save the world with your ambition, but God forbid you do something just because you want to right. for yourself. Well, now we've learned, well, that's okay, except I think the limit on that is it's okay to achieve, but not if it hurts anybody else. And it's impossible not to hurt somebody else. We're not, I don't want to hurt anybody, but sometimes someone's right. going to be hurt because sometimes, you know, I don't believe in zero sum games. I believe there are lots of opportunities, but there are some times when something you're doing or saying no to somebody, like I can't say to, yes to everybody who wants to be on this podcast. The hardest thing for me is to say no to people. The hardest thing for me is to give someone a bad grade. In other words, the hardest. so what is that about? And I often think to myself in this sort of superstitious way, well, you can't say no to that person because what if X person said no to you 10 years ago? You know, so you have to help, like in my view, I have to help every single person in the world and then I feel guilty every time I don't. And I think that's not healthy. And I don't know how what you think about that because I hear a little bit of that in, you know, yes, you're stepping away from your column because, and you have this story about how, you know, your spouse is running for reelection. And I definitely want him to be reelected. I'm not saying that, but the idea would be you don't you don't want to be blamed or have it be something that you did that would interfere with that or maybe whatever. Well, yes, but here's what's different from yeah. 2006 when he first ran to now. I'm not going to stop writing. Oh, good. I'm going to do it my way. And that's the difference for me because I am willing to say at this point in time in, in this century that and, and I already know that one of his potential opponents is he, he's spewing falsehoods about me on, you know, at, at least in one radio show already, misidentifying where I work, what I do, you know, all what? that. They're gonna do that. I understand that. Right. But that but I feel I don't want to overstate my importance in this. What I'm I do want is to have the right answer for other women who want to know why they shouldn't give up. 
And if I am constantly representing the, the woman who finally gave up on something because it was too hard, I really don't have much of anything of value to say to them. So that's on my mind more than it used to be. I mean, I, I still haven't decided if I'm going to include this in womanly ambition, that piece in particular. But in 2016, here was my plan. I, uh, I, was, I was going to start teaching, which I did at my alma mater at Kent State in the journalism school there. Mm -hmm. And I was going to keep writing my column until Hillary got elected. And I was finally going to step away from the column and just write fiction. So like most of the country and certainly most of the world, that did not happen in 2016. And the very uh, the day after the election, I went into school. I did not think we should I should be one of those faculty members. It was too hard to go. I have to stay because I knew our students were going to be. I, I mean, I'm in a journalism school and right. he was calling us the enemy of the people. And I had a line outside my office door, all, far down the hall, many of whom were not my students. It's just they, they needed to talk. So on the drive home, and I started thinking about my grandchildren, and I thought, do I want to be, do I want one of the narrative threads about my life to them? Do I want it to be that when Trump became president, grandma had already stopped writing a column? And I decided pretty quickly the answer was going to be no. Now, mm -hmm. some could make fun of, you know, how you know, here's the problem with being an empathetic person. We can always imagine the critics, yeah. right? Those are the voices yeah. we give priority to too often. <laughs> I can immediately imagine someone saying, oh, sure. Okay, your grandkids, this is why you're right. But anybody, again, who really loves a child understands where I'm coming from, I think, that um, we're a public family. We're a public service family, right? For good and bad, this is who we are. The family business is journalism and politics. Mm -hmm. at, at, its, at its roots here. And uh, I decided I didn't want that to be the case. And so I started writing. I was one of the first columnists, I think, to call, well, I'm sure of it because of how many dropped me. I was syndicated at that point with Creator Syndicate uh, because I called Trump a liar. And I said he was mm -hmm. lying. And he was mm -hmm. lying. And you remember yeah. all the angst going on with the editors? Oh, can we call it lying? We don't know what he's thinking. We don't know his intention. I thought, oh my God, are you kidding me? A lie is a lie. Right. And once we keep pointing out it's a lie and he keeps repeating it, he's just lying. Well, we got over that as an industry, as a profession, not soon enough. But I never felt, when I started having the, it wasn't a ton of editors, but a few who made it clear. If I, one of them wrote to me and said, if you call, we're not running your column this week. If you call the president a liar, if you say he's lying again, we're dropping you. I never felt like I was more on track of that, what I was doing. Really? Because I thought That's it, incredible. Cancel me then. Cancel me. I mean, I uh -huh. I wouldn't have said that a decade ago. I would have been too afraid for my career. At this point, I was more afraid for my country than I was for any particular job I was going to have. I think that was the beginning of the freeing for me. Uh -huh. I think I just turned that corner and thought, I am so done with worrying about, every, you know, all I will do what is what I'm ethically bound to do because I believe in the mission of the work, but I yes. will not curtail I mean, I never thought I had curtail it, but what they were basically, not basically, they were saying, you must change this attitude of yours if we're going to run you. And I thought, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do it at all. And the world has, and I, well, let me, before I pivot, I mean, I think that's great. Instead of feeling panicked, you know, when someone's actually saying, I will silence you, now you know the power of your voice. And, and let's, well, let's acknowledge the privilege. I have a husband with well, a job. Yep. I had a teaching job at a state university, right? So I certainly had income coming in. Yes. And I had a support system of uh, an incredible tribe of friends, a, not a big tribe, small, tightly knit group of friends, mostly women. So I did not feel I was completely alone out there. I want to be clear, though. Not everybody can do what you did by saying, fine, cancel me. You know, some some of, you know, fine, you don't have to run me. I'm going to still speak the truth. Um, but... There are plenty who can, who don't. I have seen people put, put their heads in the sand um, in the various professions and just let this slide for too long. And this is why we're where we are. Uh, you know, all of them knew what was going down in November of 2016 in the earthquake that had shaken this country. Um, and yet everyone, you know, everyone, too many people tried to pretend what was right in front of us wasn't. And that, I know the term gaslighting has been uh, overused, but that was what felt so disruptive to me to be to 
be looking at the world as it was and watching people not acknowledge it and then feeling grateful whenever somebody would finally see the light, the very few that did. Um, so now, though, the world has changed. The pivot here is that plenty of spouses, male and female, of uh, people running for office or re-election make it their business to speak out politically. I mean, we have Casey DeSantis, right, who's writing some kind of book. She's the wife of the governor of Florida. I don't want to, com I'm not comparing him to Senator Brown, of course. I mean, you know, he's, uh, one man is a monster and the other is a human with compassion and good ideas. And I don't have to tell you who is who. Um, but, you know, we, so I, I understand though from the point, of, it, but it, it also, if you're not writing news pieces, I know that you're not doing a column now, but I, I think that this idea that a columnist isn't speaking from their own personal space. Anyway, I'm just going to, I'm just Well, gonna... that happens mostly to women. Keep in mind, it's women right. who are columnists. And I'm still going to be writing essentially columns and essays, but in my own, oh, you know, it's substance. Right. So I'm just moving That's up. That's perfect. But I think where we're going, correct me if I'm wrong, one of the things is, should a spouse be open to criticism when the person is running for office? If yeah. we are campaigning for them, I mean, if I give any speech, that's the thing, this frees me up, I feel, that I can own all my worlds and I can speak out publicly for Sherry when I want to. Um, is Am I fair game for criticism? Sure. Is Chasen Buttigieg? Sure. But should they be going after Chasen as a father, as a husband? No. Right. right. Should they be going after... Uh, Giselle Fetterman for how she looks, how she dresses. I love her. I finally had, we, we've corresponded in the past. I finally got a chance to spend some time with her recently. And she is a remarkably, I mean, just, she's smart. She's funny. She was interacting with two of our grandchildren in a way that only somebody who loves children can do oh, and who I understands the value of their lives in the world. Mm -hmm. She does not deserve the attacks she's gotten, particularly when John was going through such a crisis, a medical crisis, and yes. she was doing everything she could to support not just John, but her children, right? So there should be boundaries and there should be limits, but they don't exist. Mm -hmm. And the only thing we can do is stand tall for those. When when it's my turn to be attacked, I, I feel pretty clear about this. I've got people, including you, who are going to stand tall with me. And yeah. when others are attacking, getting attacked, that's my role. When I can, I'm going to stand tall with that person because it is impossible to overstate how helpful it is when you know you're not alone in moments like that. I think that's absolutely true. And also to model the same thing. I'm noticing, um, you know, there are some candidates, that, you know, for who are running, who may have a history uh, of a past of drug addiction. And there are some folks who, uh, it, it, from my own political point of view, progressives or, you know, liberals who, I continue to point that out. And whenever I see a friend do that, like on Facebook, I'll say, you know, a lot of people have people in their family who've recovered from addiction. Can you find another ground? To yeah, please? exactly. And, so, you know, it's the. I think that's probably the best the best we can do, because I think people don't realize uh, who they're hurting and what they're doing. You're not just um, maybe hurting the person you're focused on, but you're hurting everyone else who's overcome or who has for, for whom that would be triggering and make them feel despair, especially, I mean, can you imagine being a family member or even a person who is just getting into recovery and you're being barraged by people who say someone who decades ago got over their addiction? I mean, I guess you're a, you're a, always a recovering addict, but someone who stopped using decades and decades ago and someone says, well, then they're not qualified for, for office or they're not qualified for a particular job um, just on that basis. I, I think people need to think about what they're, the message that they're sending to others in their community. I can speak to very personal experience on this. Um, as you know, my my brother killed himself four years ago this month. And so sorry, he, still. Thank you. He was um, an alcoholic and it derailed his entire life. And at one point he was in um, rehab and we were really hopeful, but only two weeks after he was released is when he died. My point here is that part of my constant worry as I was trying to help him and as my sisters and I were over several years ongoing is that people who hate Sherrod would find out. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And my worry was not what it was going to do to us. We're not ashamed to have had an alcoholic brother, a brother-in-law. What we were worried about is what it would do to him. Mm-hmm. That happened. So the measures I took at times to keep it private, to pull doctors aside who, who recognize me. And I would always say, I understand you're, you know the boundaries, but I'm going to have to remind you. And I'm going to ask you to please remind your staff because we couldn't have anybody saying Connie Schultz's brother is in, drying out right now. Cher Brown's brother-in-law, you know what I mean? That the constant worry that, 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 that and I'm saying, poor, not, I'm not saying at all, poor Connie, poor Cher, not at all. I was just in a constant state of anxiety about what could happen to my brother if it became public. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so, it's uh, all of that. I mean, and this is a question of what are we, I just wish we could be, you know, maybe I'm sunny too, kumbaya, but I wish we could be, we could think and be a more compassionate society and think about what we're doing here, this brief time we are on the planet. I mean, sometimes when I step back and think and think about that, I, I wonder if others under thought about that themselves instead of just about winning or dominating or feeling worried that someone's going to take something from them. I mean, I think when we are more charitable to each other, we're just, we're just better people. I don't I agree with you. And I don't think it's a kumbaya moment you're having here. I think <laughs> I mean, what we're saying is right. It, the mo- to me, the most important question you can ask yourself before you decide to embark on this line of attack is, How would I feel if this happened to me? Mm -hmm. Most of us want to believe we're better people than we are in our worst moments, right? And I think that question can often get us there much more quickly. How how would we want to be treated in this moment? How would we want to be remembered in this hardest moment in a life? It It won't stop everyone, but I do believe it could help a lot of people. It certainly helps me at times have second thoughts, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. We all get upset about things, but I have to think it through. How would I feel if I was on the receiving end of this line of attack? Now, I want to ask you something about how you got to this place where sort of at the center of who you are, you're a lot of things, obviously, but sort of at that core center of you is writer. So right there. When did you start writing and who do you read or who did you read when you were young that made you believe or understand that writing could be a career? Well, those are very different questions. Yes, they are. Um, Certainly for a working class kid, they are. Because I was writing from an early age, not knowing ever that that was something exceptional for a child to be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I was well into high school, my junior year, before a guidance counselor asked me what I wanted to do. I I was going to be the first in my family to go to college. That was understood, right? Um, But what was I going to do? And he was the first one to point out my grades in writing, my scores and um, editing and writing and reading and all. And had I ever thought about journalism? And when I looked so stunned, he realized what he needed to say to me because nobody had ever said this. Connie, you're going to be working for a long time in your life. You should love what you do. Because I had a father who was a utility worker, hated his job. My mom was a nurse's aide who sometimes came home with bruises on her arms because she was working on a mental health board, right? Mm. They didn't talk about loving their work, although mom did certainly love her patients. And she was a hospice home care worker towards the end of her life that ended too short at 62. Mm -hmm. But for them, they worked to live, right? They worked really hard for those few days off that they could be with their families and for the evenings when they could go to the VFW hall, right? Or the Eagles club and and hang out with friends. For me to to consider that I could love what I do for a living was, was an earthquake in my imagining my future. It's like everything got picked up, thrown up, and landed somewhere else. And I could see myself in a different place than Mm -hmm. I was before I started asking myself those questions. How do you, or how did you handle the guilt, though, that you had choices that your parents didn't have? I've never completely handled it. I say this to my working class students all the time. I have a lot of first generation students. I just tell them, you will always straddle two worlds. And in, 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 a harder truth is our parents can have really big dreams for our lives, but then they don't want us to move away or they don't want us to get too big, right? They're, my my mother in particular really struggled with that. She was incredibly proud of me, but she, I became a mystery to her because of all the things I was getting to do. And I think for my brother, it was really hard because uh, he was the only boy in the family and he was getting to do all the things my father didn't get to do or didn't have the courage to try. Because when mm-hmm. you grow up or and when you grow up with people telling you you're worthless, 
you never find the courage to believe in yourself in a big way. And I think he paid a heavier price than any of us because of that, because my dad struggled so with it, even though he mm-hmm. wanted him to have everything, then he was actually getting it and it became so challenging for him. Was your father somewhat like the character Brick from the Daughters of Erie Town in terms of, your, not every way, but in terms no. of the way he, with work, no? I'll say honestly, yeah, in some ways he was. He had a, a very similar childhood, very tough childhood, and did lose a brother in the war. Uh, um, but my father was a very violent man, and Brick is not. Brick resists that urge. He resi- resists that impulse because he doesn't want to be like his father. And that was a really conscious choice. And I wasn't sure I was going to make it first. And my editor, Kate Medina, said, you know, we're already going to have enough reasons not to like Brick. Does he need to be this violent? She said, I'm not telling you to change it, but does he need to be? And I decided he did not. Um, But he was, and he was built like my dad. I mean, certainly it's not unusual, especially your first novel. It's going to come from that deep place. But all novels, all fiction does to some extent, because our lived lives find their way into the ideas and the people we create. So, sure. um, yeah, but he was very similar to him in some ways. I get more mail, more comments about Brick than any other character. I just had a, a male friend who finally read the book and said, I'm pretty pretty pissed at Brick. <laughs> so, I hear that a lot. And my agent, I remember one point, Gail said, every time I start to like him, he does something that makes me mad at him again. It was just great. <laughs> I found that you were very um, generous toward him. Uh, There are some, I don't want to give away so much. So I will just say, you know, the scene with him in sort of dimly lit shed, looking at those newspaper clippings, almost tore my heart out. Um, If you had real regret, he had regret. And even if he wasn't willing to admit him to himself much, I don't think he was. Generous is an interesting word because I think I'm pretty rough on him because I wanted him to be better than he was, but he just just wasn't going to turn out that way, but he did have regrets and he did manage, including in his issues of race, which is very different from my father because of Sam and who she chooses to associate with and be involved that he's forcing himself because he's letting love prevail. He he loves his daughter more than he loves his racism. Um, That was a harder sell with my dad. It was a much harder. And I wrote about uh, his racism for the Atlantic um, during, I think it was the 18 presidential race, because I got tired of people. How do I say this? I really got tired, not the 18th presidential race. It was Obama's second race. Uh, 2012. Thank you. Um, I got tired of these pundits and columnists writing, well, you know, white working class voters, they're going to be racist. And I thought, well, actually, what I know is our race, our roots are our beginnings, not our excuses. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of us who reject that. And it creates great tensions in families. And that was certainly true of my relationship with my father. And so I wrote about it because he was finding his way towards the end. But mostly it was because my mother was dying. And so many of the people giving her just the exceptional care were black. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to ask you whether, did your father make lists of friends you couldn't associate with when you were a kid? Or is that just in the book? I was, no, but well, he had people he was, you know, you never knew who dad was going to be mad at next because he had a lot of perceived slights. I was grounded for a summer for having a crush on a black boy. But the, the most important piece of that book that's really true that I never thought I would have written about. And it came about because Kate Medina Really, she was my editor for my first two books. She really thought I could write fiction. I wasn't convinced. And you can. I mean, this is, I have a few things to say, but continue. Go ahead. Thank you. But I, at the time, I had my doubts because I have such, I revere fiction, good fiction. I just, you know, I've, it saved me on many a day as I was growing up. It's, it saves many of my mornings now because I think we should start the day by reading a little bit of fiction every day, whenever possible. So, at one point, she said to me, Kate just said, is there anything that's really happened in your life you've never written about that really sticks with you? And I said, yes. When I was 12 or 13, a woman showed up on our front porch and she knocked on the wrong door. This is how I knew she wasn't a friend because everybody came to the side door. And she had a child on her hip that looked more like my dad than all four of us. 
And she said, start there. Mm. That's really the, that was the seed for the book. It is so good. Um, it is yeah. your book. Um, it, it, it's, it's fitting that you chose an uh, excerpt from Betty Smith's A Tree Grows in Brooklyn because you are her natural successor. Oh, uh, that means the world to me. I would never lay claim to that, but thank you. Well, I can do that for you. Uh, it, it has, it, in some ways, it's a coming of age novel. There's lots of generations um, here. And I, I want to read the epigraph that you included, um, because I think this goes to a lot about the difference between writing fiction and nonfiction, or maybe straddling both worlds. So here, here it is. Gently, teacher explained the difference between a lie and a story. A lie was something you told because you were mean or a coward. A story was something you made up out of something that might have happened, only you didn't tell it like it was. You told it like you thought it should have been. That's Brick, right? It's also Ellie because she gets to live. Mm. And you're going to kill me because I, I know that your mother yeah. passed before your father in real life. Yes. And this time she got to live. Now she's different from my mom in many, many yeah. ways. She's a life I sometimes imagine for my mom when she found her courage. It was much harder for my mom to do. Um, and the book itself, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, was you asked me earlier, early influences. Not only was this written by a woman, it stars a girl from more a background far more similar to mine, right? That scene. Right, the that, father with a union label, he was always singing. Well, yeah. And no money, right? And right. I mean, I remember sitting, I have such vivid memories of reading that book, sitting on the front porch swing, letting my toe drag across the floor as I keep pushing myself, just reading, reading, reading it. And then in high school, it's Bruce Springsteen. And these songs are from the, are about the lives. I love him. People have you seen him? In, I'm sorry, oh, have you seen him in concert? I, I've seen him in concert numerous times. I've met him, talked to him twice, briefly. Uh, one time got to tell him, thank you for the river, which is basically the story of my parents. That mm. screen door slams was our front porch. Yep. But the thing is, what I understood from it is this man was writing poetry and putting it to music. He was. But, what, but this man was one of my people. Mm -hmm. We write poetry, too. And it was really an incredible experience to be 16, 17, 18, 19, and being able to see yourself, your life, and the life of people around you and the people you love in these lyrics and realizing there may be a place for me as a writer, too. I love that you're to two of your influences are Betty Smith and Bruce Springsteen. Um, just, I, I can't get enough. I, I know that you like the album, um, The River. I, uh, to me, and you also just referenced Thunder Road, but um, Michael and I, uh, he was a second relationship for me. I was older. I was 39 when we met and um, we got married when I was 40, but we eloped to the backyard. My friend, Sarah Buttonweiser married us because she got this uh, minister's, thing on the internet Love so that. it was just her and her kids witnessing it and uh, and um but I thought you know and I actually had gone to work at the, the I was teaching at a business school I came home put on a black dress because what else would you wear to your wedding and <laughs> <laughs> just a summer dress and then I thought I should have some wedding music so I played a little I put on some Springsteen I played uh Thunder Road and then I turned it off I had tears in my eyes we went to the backyard and we we, we got married oh my <laughs> Gosh, I love, have you ever told that story publicly? Well, now, <laughs> did I mention the part that my, our kid, our youngest kid was six months old at the time? Cause I don't do anything in the right order, Connie. <laughs> oh, I just love this story so much. Oh my gosh. I mean, there's, there's more, there's so much, but anyway, so yeah, I just, this is a, this is a wonderful book, but Thank also I, I, I asked you, I want to ask you um, before the, our final questions, a question about who you're reading now or what, you know, or what, uh, in whatever genre you, you want to say, what are the books now that uh, you are, you're looking to read or that you just read that, that moved you? I'm very careful not to mention current writers because then I offend the oh, ones who are my, I mean, mind. I'm, I'm a yes. win. So, but here's yeah. what I'm doing. But I am reading, um, see, Mary Cantwell and who else? And true, I'm reading some journal, published journals of women who came before us. There aren't that many. Okay. So easy to find, right? They're uh -huh. older. Um, 
And I think it's helping. I think it helped me make the decision to do what I'm doing now, leaving USA Today and going to. I mean, I don't know if they were going to renew my contract. I don't make it want to make it sound right, like right. it was well, coming. Substack up. is great. And by the way, I if you need any advice on the back end, how to operate it, I figured some things out the hard way. Because I would love that. I would love to do that later. Really, maybe. Thank you. I'm really <laughs> nervous about it. Um, but I figure I'm learning as I go. Right. Yeah. And I've yeah. never been able to hide that. So people will be learning along <laughs> once again. Um, but I, so I like reading some of these older journals of women. And of course, May Sarton, I love her journals. I, Who? I read Oh, May, May Sarton. Sarton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I will highly recommend one biography right now. That I've been recommending a lot because I, I'm learning so much. It's uh, Stephen Igg's, uh biography of Martin Luther King. It's okay. called King, Colon, A Life. And I am going to share a story from it, I think, soon in one of my pieces I'm writing because he describes the scene First of all, Martin Luther King was so very young when he started becoming a public figure. He's not even 30s in his mid 20s when the Montgomery boy, uh, bus boycott happens. And then the night before it's supposed to start, they have no idea if this is going to work. Have they convinced enough black residents not to get on the bus Monday morning? Mm-hmm. So he has a rough night, doesn't sleep well. Neither does his wife, Coretta. So they're up early. He's in the kitchen around 530 in the morning drinking coffee. And Coretta is out in the living room looking out the window. And all of a sudden she says, Martin, come here. And a bus is going by and it's empty. And then another bus goes by and it's empty. And he gets in the car and starts driving around and seeing all these empty buses. Tell me that is not the illustration of hope. That if you work at it, if you if you believe in the cause, if you can convince people that it can get better if we do something together. I mean, mm-hmm. that that story alone, that scene, I had never heard it before, never read it. And it I can't stop thinking about it. I can't either. And that Thank book for... is full of that. It's just full of those kinds well, of... I'm going to read that. And you said it was uh, Steve Ides? E-I-G. E-I-G. Oh. Uh, that is, it's hauntingly beautiful. Um, and it gives me the kind of hope that I need that I needed today. So thank you. One last thing. What didn't I ask you that you thought I might? And how do people find you? Well, you have such a curious mind. And I'm, I'm sorry. I know I tripped, not tripped you up, slowed you up because I started asking you questions, but I'm so <laughs> interested in you. So I can't really lay claim to thinking there's anything you should be been asking me because this has been a really um, exhaustive interview. So thank you for that. I, also, um, I was talking to the person who helps with my scheduling, Sue Klein, and we both had your email that came in, the prep email. And she said, I don't think anybody's read that book more closely than your husband, except for Sue, for Jennifer Taub, because it was, uh, I, I just want to thank you for that. What a close read. Thank you for understanding <laughs> what I was trying to do with that novel. That means the world to me. Um, they can find me all over the place, right? Still on Twitter for a while here. We'll see how that goes. I'm on threads, as are you, I believe now. I'm on yes. Facebook where we have conversations every single day. I love the community we built there. And I'm on Instagram. And as of next week, probably, I think it's when it's going to, I'm going to commit next week. Uh, I'll be on Substack, hopefully yours. And by the time people are listening, you will already be on Substack, given our oh, schedule. Boy. So, okay. uh, yeah, so it's it's true. It's It's already happened. This is like time travel and you can <laughs> find... Connie, right now on Substack at at hopefully yours. Oh, here we go. (laughs) How has it been? Isn't it been great? Your Substack? It's amazing. Oh, my Lord. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. That's so funny. Well, I deserve that. Here we go. You know, my I have a friend, Jackie, who always says that the way I do things is I throw my head over the fence so that I have to go after it. So here I go. Right now in the summer, it's a straw hat. It's a very fine, wide brim (laughs) straw hat. Here I go. Yay. (laughs) Thanks again. Thanks, Jen. Connie has this way of casting a spell on you. I, like all of our guests, want to talk more with her. And what's especially powerful about her, and I know that you can't see her uh, when we're talking, but just looking into her eyes, even across the distance, the many, many miles we are apart, you just feel like you're you're having a conversation with a dear family member or, or, or a longtime friend. I look forward to the day when we can actually sit together over a cup of coffee or a meal together and 
talk for more than a brief period of time. I want to share with you a passage from Connie's novel, The Daughters of Erie Town. Um, This one uh, really took my breath away. Um, It's late into the novel and it won't give anything away. This is um, Ellie, who's uh, the the mother character, uh, saying to her daughter, daughter Sam. It's what I've learned about grief, Ellie said. Not just grief after death, but the grief you can feel after something rocks your world. Grief is that monster that bangs at your door until you let it in and sit with it for a while. When you get bored with each other, the monster leaves. I encourage you to pick up a copy of The Daughters of Erie Town or one of Connie's memoirs, or even better yet, log into Substack and and follow her there. She is uh, full of hope and full of, her columns are full of humanity. And I always feel like I've left with something new to think about. Um, and I felt like I have explored a new aspect of humanity every time I read something Connie has written. So thank you for listening. I'll be back next week with another episode of Booked Up as we continue to explore the writing process and the nonfiction world together. Let us know what you think. Send an email to bookedup at politicon.com. You can also write to Booked Up at P.O. Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061.